Good evening, and welcome to the Writer's Block. I'm your host, John Ronan, and as you know now, because we are beginning to wind up our 34th year, I interview writers about their craft, what they're working on, what they've accomplished, what they're looking forward to. It's a slightly wider net than that, however. We have had on painters, we've had on musicians, we've had on sculptors. So if you have an idea for a guest who might be a good fit for the writer's block, writer or other brand of artist, watch for our address at the end of the show. We'd love to get your suggestions. I also want to remind you that the writer's block and all the other original programming that comes out of 1623 Studios is a result of cable access television. It's a wonderful community access asset, excuse me, that you don't get with other means of reaching the internet. So stick with cable, stick with the writer's blog. Tonight, I'm very happy to say we do have a writer, as per usual, and he is a debut novelist who has just come out with a very, very wonderful, exciting, pleasurable comic read that is both a mystery and a an essay, a comic essay about the state of uh, state of the country. It's called "The Last Taxpayer at King Henry's Fair" by Bill Scannell. Bill Scannell, w William Scannell. Yes. Well, welcome to the Writer's Blog. Thank you very much, John. Thank you for coming down. I enjoyed this, and I want and hope that all our viewers go out and boost the sales into the thousands. From your lips to God's ears. It's a very, very, very amusing book. I enjoyed it. I wanted, as I mentioned before, we went on the air. I want to ask you some background questions. Oh, yeah. Where are you from originally, Bill? Uh, I was born and raised in Worcester, Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll always be uh, a Worcesterian, I guess. But uh, I'm, when we moved here to Cape Ann uh, and I found Gloucester, I realized that, uh, you know, this is. Um, this is Worcester with an ocean, and a, and a smaller population, of course. But uh, yeah, Worcester's quite a good-sized city. Yeah, but the the people are the same. They speak uh, their mind. They tell you what they think, and uh, you know you have to live with it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. It's, right. So it's it's so a nice. Place. When when did you move to Cape Ann? Uh, Twelve, uh, ten years ago, eleven ten. years ago now. Oh, so, uh, in two thousand twelve. Two thousand twelve. Yeah. And you found it habitable. Well, you know, when my dad died, uh, my wife and I moved up here. We took that opportunity to uh, move up here. He needed some care before he passed away. Uh -huh. and, uh, but after that, we, uh, we always intended to check this place out. But then we came here and we decided we just have to live here. Well, you have the, that's the right attitude to have. Yeah, it it's, 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 wasn't optional. And you end up your book, I think, the, not the last chapter, but the second or third last, <laughs> in Gloucester, in yeah. the Inner Harbor, with a... I'm not going to have any spoilers here, but a big discovery. Well, and I know the mooring that boat is on, too. Yes. In the, <laughs> yeah. I didn't know there was a federal mooring uh, area. Is there? Yes. Yeah. Uh, in fact, right in front of Solomon Jacobs uh, uh, Landing, which is where the harbor master is, uh -huh. the federal, the, is a federal field. I didn't know there were, there's all kinds of fields out there, uh, mooring, yeah. mooring areas, uh, but I didn't know there was a federal one. Well, the federal field is, is unique um, to Gloucester Harbor in that you can just drop a hook and you can stay there for up to 30 days and then you have to vacate. Uh, I don't know how long you have it's to stay away. on the East Coast. You know, but, well, the price big, is right. Big population, yeah. I'll say. Actually, I think we have the, not to, not to digress too far here, but I think we have the best harbor and, uh, and the best harbor master and, and staff that uh, you'll find anywhere on the East Coast, anywhere. Good to hear. It's Good true, to hear. too. I mean, I'm uh, not just making uh, that up. You, where did you go to high school, and then where did you go after high school? <laughs> uh, I went to Worcester Academy in Worcester, and uh, it's a boys' school, and uh, it's a good place to put me, I think, uh, for four years. And then I went to Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs, New York. Oh, yeah. Saratoga and, winds up in your book, too. Yeah, it does. And, uh, and I worked at the track, too, there when I was in school, which was great. I loved the track. Who wouldn't? And you know? I, we used to go every summer to Saratoga. They were right across the street in a B and B. Yeah. And I, I was, I used to live in Chicago and live in Arlington Park for a while. Okay. Got, got to be a little bit of a problem. 
Yeah. Uh, but I love Saratoga. You, you think racing's it. the only sport in America when you're at Saratoga. It is. Uh, it's a wonderful town. It's been dressed up a little bit now since, yeah. since I was there. Uh, and um, I mean, I love it both ways. But, um, and the track I'll always love. I, think, I, I was a fireman. I think you, you were. I was a fireman at the track. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I drove a U-Haul truck with one hose in it. They never taught <laughs> me how to use it. It was there for insurance purposes. <laughs> Uh, the fire truck, that's not one of the trucks that follows the race. Or is that just the ambulance? Uh, that they wouldn't let me near. I, I once chased a horse in a truck, and uh, you, you would have think that, thought that I, I, I dropped a bomb or something. Because the, the horse is more valuable than I or the truck I was driving. <laughs> so tell me, you told me bef uh, before that we went on the air what you did for many years in Worcester as an, for an occupation. Um, I, I practiced law. In Worcester. Where did uh, you go to law school? Uh, I went to Suffolk University Law School. Great law school, I might add. So you spent a lot of time in the eastern part of the state. Here. I have. I have. And uh, I got a, when I was in uh, my second year, I got a job as a voluntary prosecutor in uh, Worcester. And so I, I would work, uh, besides school, I would then go and uh, try cases in Worcester. And after that, everyone who did that, we all got hired by the DA. So I, I went right from law school into a job, and it was a wonderful job. Good DA, John Conti, was very nice to us, and um, got to try cases as a kid. It was such fun. Such fun. And you were there for? I was there for a few years, yeah. and then uh, I went to the um, uh, City of Worcester Law Department where I was an assistant city solicitor, and there I did the First Amendment cases, which were, um, they were legion, there were so many of them. And it was... Uh, it's a bill of the uh, speech rights. Yeah, well, speech rights, yes. And um, uh, in, in there, most of our litigation had to do with, um, with new dancing establishments. And that was, <laughs> that is free speech. Um, but it, it rubbed uh, the citizens of Worcester and, and the church, I might add, the wrong way. So um, we would be, uh, uh, it was an antagonistic relationship. And this is an era when the church was still an untouchable institution, long, long before the spotlight uh, Absolutely. focused on Well that. before that. And, um, and what, made, uh, what made this so, uh, such a, uh, a hot-button issue is one, one of these strip clubs, it was called the, uh, the Blue Mac, was put up right next to uh, Immaculate Conception Church, <laughs> where, where I was uh, uh, baptized, I might add. And, uh, you know, that caused a ruckus because uh, it was right next to the church, but there were also, there was no parking spot for the uh, strip club, so they would just park at the church, and it looked like there was a service going on every night, you know? There was. There was. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, was, it was fun. It was fun. It was a fun it's, job. And, yeah, it uh, sounds like it was a fun job. You know, and I got to know the other lawyer, and this guy, you know, I, I been, Kenny Tatarian was his name. He's a great guy. And, you know, we got to meet him, and you know, it'd be just the, the same old thing every, uh, every week or two. We'd do a deposition of somebody. I want to ask, because your background's in law and in uh, uh, active as a prosecutor, so it wasn't theoretical. Oh, it was no, a, no. It wasn't no, theoretical law. Theoretical. How did you get interested in writing, and when did you start thinking about the last taxpayer? Um, not to be overly uh, uh, um, personal, but... I've always enjoyed writing. I've always, it's something I've always done to some degree. Um, I didn't do it, uh, I wasn't able really to do it well or seriously until I stopped drinking, which was like 25 years ago or something. Oh, like it's been ago. a while. It's been a while, yeah. And uh, I did it old school too, which was awful, really. Just solo, <sighs> solo. stop. Personality thing, you know. <laughs> yeah. But in well, any event, so after that, I mean, the, the benefit I got out of that was, of course, you know, I don't drink anymore, but uh, I could write. And, uh, this, so this, I this is really professionally done. Thank and you. I, was, uh, I was impressed by it. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, when did you start writing this? And when did you get the idea for the protagonist, Nix? Oh, Nix has been in my head for a while. But uh, she's, um, she's a, a conglomerate of, of several people. But... Um, and she's an exaggeration, too, because everything she does is virtually criminal. Like yeah, close to yeah. It's, there's, there's no uh, serious case of the, the real criminals in there. Well, some of them. Some of them. But really. Nix is a nickname for 
Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn and Nick. Yeah. Doesn't, doesn't like uh, to use uh, Gwen or Gwendolyn too much. Uh, but I was I was kind of surprised or curious about you, a male, choosing a woman as your protagonist and central character in this and your following two books. Okay, the, it's a good question. It's a great question. And it, but it, I didn't do it, you know, for any reason except that uh, I, I had an older sister. She's, she's passed away. And uh, she was my boss, you know. She told me what to do all the time. Uh, she, she was difficult. And, um, you know, she's part of, Nick's is, is somewhere, I'm used to that. How much older was she? Three years older. She was the boss, huh? Oh, she was. She was the boss. Sounds like some nuns I knew. Oh, man, I mean, I'm <laughs> still afraid of nuns. <laughs> it sounds like my sister. Yeah. How long did it take you to write this from the first time you sat down seriously at the typewriter or with a pen and paper? Uh, I don't know. I, got a, I wrote another book before this. I got a rejection. I got my hundredth rejection. That's right. It was my hundredth. I called my daughter and I said, I'm done with this like, symbolic thought. So this series. I said, I'm going to write what I know for this. And this involves... And it, was, it, it didn't take the kind of time you think it took. It might, like it took maybe six months. Six months? Maybe. A couple maybe. rewrites? Yeah, I, would, I rewrite as I go. Okay, I'll, I'll write something. I'll write three chapters. And, and then I'll start four and five, and I'll say, wait a minute. And then I'll go back, and then I'll do a rewrite. You write on a keyboard, or do you write some keyboard. longhand? Uh, only if I don't have a keyboard do I write longhand. Uh -huh. And, uh, and I, I, I still like uh, writing longhand, but I've, uh, I've adjusted to a keyboard. Uh, Nix is a uh, IRS agent. Yes. And she has a partner, Steiger, or Steiger, I don't know. Steiger. Steiger. Is how I call Steiger. Him. And, uh, and a kind of a bum, doofus boss named Bosom. Buffum, yeah. Buffum, Buffum. And, uh, but, but, so, so it starts, doesn't start out at King Henry's Fair, which no, I thought no, no. before I read the book would be this nice, polite uh, Renaissance organization. But it is not a nice, polite Renaissance organization. <laughs> it's, the no. king is a, Super criminal, and I have to watch the spoilers here. He was is a, is a criminal in many, many, yeah. many ways. Talented as a criminal, and his queen is kind of the same way. And there are many uh, other people associated with the fair who aren't delicate Renaissance portrayers. Yeah. Uh, where did you get the idea for the fair? Or for that, right, uh, and the, melding the IRS and the fair? Well, first of all, the, the IRS, I, I got the idea for the, including the IRS, in this because um, I said like, all right, before I started this book, I said like, who are the worst people in the world? And I said, well, okay, the IRS has got to be in there somewhere. And uh, so that, there, there's Nix and Steiger. And uh, then I started to think of like, who, you know, who else can I put in here as spoils or is, as uh, an antagonist to this person? And uh, I remember my, my youngest daughter telling me about um, uh, a uh, affair uh, it wasn't around here, and uh, the um, the guy who was like the potter in this fair uh, was 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 proud that he had three three generations of illiteracy in his family. <laughs> in his family, I said, well, that that qualifies then. So that's how I got those two. And then well, the rest of it. Just I think a lot itself. of people will agree with you on the IRS. Uh, point oh out. yeah, yeah. I, I'm no one's going to get any. I won't get any arguments on that. But you're uh, the, the the narrator. When the narrator's not the fool or somebody else, the the uh, author's narrator yeah. uh, likes Nix very much and has her open up a couple times, yeah. uh, thinking, uh, talking to the fool about her background and mm -hmm. his background. There's some very softness and sympathy there, even There's though love almost. What? There's almost love. I, I wondered what was going to happen there, but maybe in the book too. Not, nothing happened, nothing well, between them happens here. You know, the fool, his name is Charlie. Charlie, yes. And uh, the fool stays with, with Nick, and, um, and he's, uh, he's an important part. I, I've written an, a, a sequel to this, which I haven't uh, yet had published. And I also have a, uh, I'm working right now on the, on the third and final um, Nick's book. So this is, the second one is called uh, uh, The River, uh, no. Second one is called Nix O'Clock. <laughs> Nix O'Clock. And yeah, the third yeah. one is River Nick. Because uh, it takes place in the sewers of Chelsea. 
uh, the fool is Charles Asperance, also known as Charlie Crow, and I believe from the first chapter, Rodrigo's the nickname. Yes, yeah, it's his uh, ID. Yeah, and he's ID. yeah, and he is uh, he's often the narrator. Yeah, uh, often the narrator of the book, and he uh, has a pretty tough background, as does Nix. And then the fool, of course, is from the fair, and mm -hmm. Nix is from the other camp, the IRS camp. Uh, but they they hook they, they become unified in in many ways in that book, but. Um, he, uh, the, the fool is, a, is, a, is the most complex character in my book, and he is the only character who is transformative. The other characters are static, and uh, he's steady state. So um, the movement, if you will, the emotional movement in the book uh, is, is only, is, it, it tracks him, and that's important. That's why I have uh, fool chapters, or Charlie chapters, that are first person, just to emphasize the diff that there's a differential between the people, between Charlie and everybody else in this yeah. book. Yeah, yeah, because there's he's, a definite uh, pronounced arc to his, uh, yes. to his uh, character. So I, I made him that way, and, and I, I made, structurally I made him that way as well. And, um, but he emerges as a, uh, a more definitive individual in the second book. And in the third book, he is um, his own. He, is, he emerges as, uh, as an individual who uh, needs no support at, this, at that point. And he, he's, the, he's the heart, he's the soul of, of my book, of these three books. Uh, do you ever consider that you might have a, a series, a long series here, like, like uh, um, Sue Grafton did with her crime novels? And John, if I get traction, I'll do, I'll do whatever I have to do. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm not in a position to be picky. Where is The Last Axe Fair at King Henry's Fair available? It's available at um, Dogtown Book. It's available at Amazon. Uh, it's available at um, what's the other bookstore. The, yeah. Book, the bookstore, yeah. Uh, oh, the bookstore in, in uh, Gloucester, yes. Yeah. But I mean the, uh, the other, uh, Barnes & Noble. Barn, yeah, 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 it's, yeah, it's available at those places. And uh, uh, I know it's about four or five of them at the uh, at dog. Now. How are you doing on the rankings? You going, know, going I, up? since this has been out, I've had five stars at Amazon. And I never went below five stars. But I don't know how many have been sold. It's not, you know, whatever, however many have sold it, uh, maybe I spent it on one, taking my wife out for dinner one time. Well, it's, I hope uh, hope a lot more people uh, pick it up. It's uh, it's really an enjoyable book. It's fun uh, to write. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention, I have other questions, but one of the things I wanted to mention to encourage our readers to buy the book is the humor in the book. And the, I, I picked out a couple places that I think were notable for their humor. Um, but there's humor everywhere. I mean, it's not just here and there. Uh, instead of saying somebody screams really loud or awfully loud or something, something weak like that, you say, he immediately started screaming like he was being paid by the decibel. Excellent. Funny and accurate and makes, uh, makes sense. In another place, uh, two characters, uh, two, uh, two of the principal characters are on their way to a funeral no less, it's raining. The wipers worked perfectly, except for a broad swath on the driver's side at eye level. Now, you don't have to say, that's always where they It's always the that's case. Always, you, you, you get it, because that's exactly right. And there's a good eye in here, in many, many, many places for humor. Uh, Thank you so much the, the for plot that. Of, the plot itself, but it's some of the descriptive lines, the diction is really, really effective. It's the Esperanto of the vulgar. <laughs> Good. Well said. Well, said. is there a section in here, a paragraph or two, that you might choose to read that kind of expresses for you the tone or some part of the character, any of the characters, that kind of summarize or yeah. are symbolic of the whole book? You know, as uh, I don't know about that, but I do know that, um, like, the book is really about Nick and Charlie. It's yeah. their relationship, but um, I do love the queen in this book, and she's a uh, she's a, a a great character, and uh, she's like a um, 
a ray of sunshine, dirty sunshine, filthy, <laughs> filthy sunshine, yeah. in, in, a, in an otherwise worse world. So uh, I, I, I probably would, and also I think I can read something that's safe for uh, the queen to say. And she's... Uh, what page are you going to be at? How long can I read this? Well, a couple paragraphs, page. Okay. This is Diane is the queen. Diane is the queen, and she says... Uh, so she's, uh, what, what page? she's on, the, I'm on page 20. She's on the phone with the, uh, with the psychic hotline because they're trying to come up with a plan to, uh, to uh, fight the IRS who's trying to come to, they think, repossess. And she's not, the principal and the psychic hotline, she's asking for advice yeah. from the psychic. She's asking for, yeah. she gets a battle plan yeah. from the, uh, and anyway, after she hangs up the phone, she talks to the king. And um, so I think we're up on page uh, uh, 21. And she, he, the king says, well, what are you doing, Diane? And she said, I'm talking to the psychic hotline. And he says, uh, um, uh, you know, do you, um, why are you doing that? Is it about the races, you know? He said, no, what are you talking about the races? I'm asking her about this, uh, the IRS problem. And uh, so in the, after the, at the top of the page, or I guess around 10 lines down, she says, uh, the king says, uh, she said, what? He said, I know, right? She said, we've got to wage siege warfare. That's what she said. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard, said the king. Uh, I know, right? But, there's, uh, but what she also said, uh, she said, we've got, to all, uh, we've got to call the news media. And I say to her, really, Doris? How do we call the news media? And it goes on, uh, and she goes, it's just newspapers, radio stations, laundromat bulletin boards, and local TV. She even said we ought to put something in the church bulletin. Can you imagine? The walls would come tumbling down. She said to go to the nearest college and put posters up about how the government is picking on us. Okay, why? Don't you see? As long as the reporters and the students and the cameras are around, they'll be afraid to bother us. We'll look like victims, and they'll look like bullies. We are victims. And they are bullies. I know, right? Can you stop saying that, Diane? Saying what? I know, right? You know what? I know, right? You said it all the time. It's bothering me. Oh, it bothers you. Hmm. I didn't know you were going to go in there. Let me go to your, uh, get your list of faults out of my delicate drawer, and we can hot hash this out. Okay, Diane, forget it. But can you not use that uh, all the time? I know, right? Is that what you mean? I know, right? Yes, that's what I mean. It's annoying. I know, right? Oops. I've got an idea, honey. Why don't I just substitute one phrase for another, train myself to say something else whenever I want to say, I know, right? I know what I can say. I'll say the king is the 31st best lover I ever had. Whenever I really want to say, I know right. Problem solved. <laughs> very nice, very nice. And the queen is a, uh, a wild character. In fact, I, I am going to cite another humorous line. She is talking about uh, keeping prisoners. <laughs> and she talks about a red ball gag with black straps, which we've seen in horror movies. It's a red ball to keep people shut up and a strap to hold it in their mouth. Yeah. He says, get the red ball gag with the black straps. It's in my delicate drawer. I love that. Uh, and she just mentioned in that yeah. line earlier, her delicate drawer. Yeah, and uh, then Nix pelts him with, uh, 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 it, it sends him to the, the king to the hospital while he's tied to, a, to the stock. Yes, yes. With a ball gag in his and mouth. When, when the cops come in and arrest him. And, yeah. um, it's fun. When you sit down to write, you write on a schedule, say, weekdays I'm going to write three hours every morning, no. or something like that. How, how, do you, how do you organize your process? I'm retired, for one thing. So uh, my time is more my own than most people, and I'm very fortunate in that respect. I write all the time, honestly. I mean, it's a, what I love to do. So I do it when I can. So I do it, you know, my wife is still working, she's younger. And uh, I write all day. And then I, you know, have dinner and I write it for the night. You write at night as well? I do. And I go to bed. And then you wake up in the morning and write some more? I do. Yeah. It's, it's my favorite thing to do. This atmosphere, the atmosphere at the fair, the atmosphere in the IRS office, the atmosphere in these people's heads, is not what you think of when you think of Rockport or Gloucester or Cape Ann. No. These kind of things don't happen up here. You, have well, a, you don't know. Do you have uh, a hard time? Well, 
not they they don't happen as much i think no do you have to does it take you a little coffee or some kind of mantra to shift gears from listening yeah. to the birds or the, I, to, I think crazy stuff does happen here and uh you know on a daily basis and uh, i'm just unearthing a little bit of it, maybe exaggerating somewhat too. But yeah, we have had some crazy things happen here. And uh, crazy things happen where I'm from too. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, this book isn't that crazy to me. And, and I do love to write. So I, I've got a second one that I did, and it was more fun than this one to write. And the third one is even more fun. So I'm not, uh, I haven't hit burnout yet. And Nix is in all of them. Oh yeah, Nick's Nick, is, and then the, the fool, Charlie. Charlie's in all of Charlie them Crow. It, it, Charlie Crow is now Charlie, and uh, and he's got a good friend, and he's emerging as a uh, as a more full human being, and he's uh, coming out of his head, if you will, and you know, having a real relationship with other people, not not sexual relations, but human relations that yeah. he wasn't really able to have when he was living at the fair. Because well, and, and before his pre-fair life was uh, uh, was such that you wouldn't think he'd be able to even talk or walk and talk at the same time. But yeah. he's he survived and he grows, and uh, largely because of the encouragement from Nick. Almost yes, exactly. And he learns to write, and he keeps a diary. And uh, in the subsequent books, I use his diary just as I used his first-person narrative. In this book, to emphasize him, I use his um, his uh, diary entries where he's trying to, about how he's trying to improve himself uh -huh. uh, throughout the book. And what they do, what it does is, when when the when the books go, you know, off the charts, so to speak. Or, I mean, he Charlie brings everything back in, back into a, a, a normal state. You know, yeah. when things get really loony, oddball. We're almost out of time. Yeah. I want to thank you, it's such a William, pleasure. William thank Cannell, you. to come and share with us uh, some factual background on the last taxpayer at King Henry's Fair. It's oh, a John, wonderful book. I want to, want to stress that. It's a wonderful book. It's fun. Yeah. It moves right along. It's really, it's, a quick, it's like a quick roller coaster. Movie. It really, uh, I, I enjoyed it. And I thank hope you it, so much. I really it, appreciate oh, it. Well, thank you. I appreciate you coming down. And uh, and uh, glad to have you on. I look forward to the new book. Yeah, I hope somebody picks it up and publishes it. Thank you. Thank you, John. I want to thank our television audience as well. You if are. you've learned something about the, I want to get this right, the last taxpayer at King Henry's Fair, and its author Bill Cannell, then the Writers Block has done its job. Thanks for being with us. See you again next time on the Writers Block. Good night.